Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the La Germania Food Business Bootcamp Series 2, Survive and Thrive, How Food Businesses Can Adapt to the Pandemic. My name is Margot Sue, and I will be your host this evening. We've got a very special lineup of panelists for tonight's panel discussion, of course, brought to you by La Germania. For the food printers out there, this one's for you. In this evening's event, hear from our expert panelists on what it takes to kickstart a successful food business, along with a full list of actionable tips, insights, and best practices to help all of our food entrepreneurs survive and thrive amidst the pandemic. To all our foodies in the audience, we'd love to hear from you. Engage with us on social media by following and tagging at La Germania PH on Facebook and Instagram. Don't forget to tag us on your stories and posts. But before we begin, we'd like to introduce Claudia Tagle, Marketing Associate at General Heat Corporation, to officially welcome all of you to this evening's event. Good evening to all our students in the audience, and thank you so much for joining us on the Latter-Kanias Business Program. We're super thrilled to be with all of you tonight, and we've got a lot of exciting things to our students, including a lineup of really great speakers who will be telling us more about their own experiences, tips, and advice. We know that these times are challenging, and with the current circumstances that we're in, ensuring that your business and private may get through difficult times is essential. This is the reason why we at the Academy of Philippines want to create this exclusive event in that series to help all the F&B industry navigate through these crises. So for the foodies and aspiring entrepreneurs out there who are still trying to cross that hurdle of setting up their own businesses, rest assured that the Latin Maya is here to help bring out that kitchen genius and help equip you with the necessary tools and best practices to safeguard your business and set it up for success. Thank you very much, Claudia. To our guests this evening, I'm sure you're just as excited as I am. Okay, I'm not sure if there's some technical difficulties, but yeah, like I was saying, um, we're, we're all just excited um, to hear from our speakers. But before we do, I'd like to remind everyone to hold on to your questions throughout the evening and save them for our Q&A portion. As we dive into this evening's panel discussion, be sure to drop those questions in the Q&A box down below, and we'll get to those later on in the program. All right, let's get started. Everyone meet our panelists for this evening. At a time when the restaurant and food and beverage industry was brought to its knees, Lola Nenas Pichi Pichi, purveyor of the wildly popular triple cheese donuts, has not only survived, but thrived. Apart from their famed bestseller, they also offer many other timeless Filipino favorites, such as Pancit, Toasted Jopao, and of course, Pichi Pichi. As chief marketing officer, our first panelist is in charge of crafting fresh sales and marketing strategies to drive growth, such as promoting their products on sensational video sharing app TikTok, where they have gained thousands of followers over a short period of time. The role requires applying knowledge and innovation, but also listening to their loyal customers. For her, the job at its core is all about storytelling, bridging their food made with love every day to their customers. Let's all welcome Steffi Santana. Hi, Margo. Thanks for the intro. I'm so happy to be here. Hi, everybody watching. Awesome. And our next panelist for this evening is 32-year-old entrepreneur who graduated marketing from University of Asia and the Pacific. She is the founder of Aperitif the pioneer of the art of grazing in the Philippines, in which the world famous grazing box was invented. During the lockdown, she also co-founded Pisulu, a fast growing brick oven pizza delivery service. Aside from the food business, she is also a co-founder and board of director of Sundowners Chain of Resorts, 
that can be seen in Bolinao, Pangasinan, and Zambales, and a partner in a new COVID testing lab called Fast Labs. <laughs> Everyone, let's all welcome Carla Zulueta. Hi, guys. Thank you for being here, and I'm so excited to learn from everyone tonight. Thanks for inviting me. See you later. And to our foodies in the house tonight, here's another food entrepreneur that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Our third panelist for this evening was born and raised in San Diego, California. He grew up on burgers and at the age of 30, with no formal training, started his first and only restaurant, Sweet Ecstasy. Alongside his partner in life, the two of them formed Kidlat and Kulog Incorporated, the F&B group that runs the burger concept that aspires to set standards in the local Manila fast casual scene. With a sharpened focus on freshness, quality, and customer service above all else, Sweet Ecstasy has been unusually boring and consistent in an age of social media where hype is driven and change is expected. He intends to help guide his company and brand through this next stage while prioritizing safety and sustainability alongside deliberate controlled growth that will hopefully reach international markets in the next few years. Let's all give a sweet welcome to Al Gatlang, founder of Sweet Ecstasy. Thank you, Margo, and hi, everybody. I, I hope we can uh, be inspiring, uh, relatable, and maybe uh, get you hungry enough to order something from us before we all close the night. <laughs> For sure. I'm sure we're all going to be drooling. And finally, our last panelist this evening is going to give us a fresh and strategic perspective on what it takes to help your food business thrive. With 30 years of corporate and entrepreneurial experience, he specializes in marketing, business development, and training. He occupied management posts on Sumo Sam Foods Incorporated, Big's Diner, Food and Hospitality Events Specialist Incorporated, Finma Education Network, San Miguel Pure Foods, Great Food Solutions, Kenny Rogers Roasters Philippines, and in International Family Food Services Incorporated. That's a lot. He is the CEO of his 19-year-old management firm, Courage Asia Management Consulting as food business coach and corporate trainer for brands such as Wolfgang Steakhouse, Mama Lou's Italian Kitchen, Mother Spice Food Group, Red Crab Food Group, among others. He has a combined 20 years of teaching experience with the Thames International Business School, Holy Angel University, Ender Run Colleges, and Raffles Education Group in Malaysia. He was the editorial consultant and columnist of the 12-year-old F&B World food service trade magazine, and a contributor to Food Magazine. Everyone, let us all welcome our final panelist for this evening, Adolfo Aran Jr. Good evening, Marco. Good evening to everyone. I'm so uh, honored to be part of this uh, discussion and to be in the midst of foodpreneurs that offer three of the, my favorite things, uh, pizza, burgers, and donuts. And yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Jordania for uh, inviting me here. Yes, awesome. And that is our fantastic lineup of panelists this evening. I'll ask you all to turn on your cameras so we can see your beautiful faces once again. And everyone, here's how it's going down. We've prepared a few questions for our panelists tonight, and we'll be tackling some of those burning questions that I'm sure a lot of you have for them this evening. Keep an ear out for those useful tips, insights, and best practices that our panelists have prepared for you. And if at any point you have questions that you want to raise, drop those in the Q&A button below, and we'll get to those after our panel proper. To our panelists, guys, of course, feel free to chime in whenever you feel motivated or something pops up in your head. Let's keep this as free flowing as possible. And 100% sure, yeah, that everyone has fresh insights to bring into this discussion. Are we ready? Ready. Yeah. Born yeah. ready. Oh. Let's okay. go. <laughs> All right. The first question is for Carla. Um, Aperitif was one of the first brands that really leveraged social media way before the pandemic. What's the story behind it? And can you tell us more about the brand experience that you wanted to create for your consumers? How did you harness social 
media to grow the brand. So Upper Teeth started 2016 and it was way before the pandemic. And it was just really a hobby of mine, you know, curating food that are very Instagrammable. And um, we, it was when the art of grazing has been flourishing in Australia. And the idea of grazing, we placed it with the brand and we thought, how do you actually have graze platters delivered to everyone's homes without the cost of a very expensive platter? And that's where the graze box was born. So the graze box was a version of a grazing platter. And back then when you try to Google or hashtag graze box, nothing comes out. It was really us, the first, the first ones to be able to invent that. In fact, we had it patented. But despite having it patented, you know, when we launched the Graze Box online, it went viral. So we owe it to the Graze Box virality and how Instagrammable it is. Uh, we owe it to that uh, why we have 113,000 followers right now. So four years ago, it was like, you know, the sushi bake of ECQ. We had so much competition and copycats. And I remember I can name a hundred, like a hundred brands who copy the Graze Box, but um, you know, after some time with the correct time amount of branding and um, innovation with a brand of Aperitif until now, it's still the pioneer and it's still the best in the grazing industry. So the Aperitif experience is all about the art of grazing and, uh, and about also the art of having celebrations delivered to you in your doorstep. At the same time, having an art piece in every event. So whenever we create events before with the grazing tables, and we, we, which we also pioneered in the Philippines, it's always a masterpiece. You know, each table is designed for hours, like three hours, and eaten in a span of 10 minutes. So um, if we have seen the, the kind of grazing tables that we would do before, it was really like painting with food. So the whole like, creative experience is very creative. It's very innovative. and every event that we used to do before is always one of a kind. So, and we try to match that with the boxes that we do right now and with the boxes that we get to deliver to our clientele. Yeah, so, and I have to, yeah, I have to say when you said a lot of people, there are copycats everywhere. I'm a, I'm a, I'm one of those people. <laughs> I, definitely, I definitely saw, not like I tried to start my own business, but I definitely saw <laughs> And, I, and my friends would say, oh, you know, so-and-so is having a baby shower. Let's look at Aperitif Instagram. And it's, it's a good thing, right? It's, it must be, feel very flattering to have people go to your social media and find that. Inspo. Give them yeah. I remember back then I used to like get so annoyed when I see an exact copy because it's like imagine having your painting uh, yeah. in your head for the longest time and have it copied exactly to the same kind of box the same jam the same label but you know like it's food it's very easy to be copied so I know at the end of the day what what gets you to the top is branding and you know mm -hmm. having loyal customers and having the good service and loyalty to people um, aside from the grace box having you know, the essence of virality and, you know, movement came from social media movement and following came from because of the virality of the Grace Box. It was also like the amount of free press that we were able to get during that time. So mm -hmm. I remember, I think around every magazine, every online magazine that had millions of followers, Karina Sanchez, Karen Davila, Jessica Soho, Chris Aquino, we all got free press. You know, we didn't spend a single cent on on TV advertising and social media. Uh, sorry, not social media, but but um, magazine advertising. And I think that's one of the perks when you have a product that everyone is talking about. You know, the press could would want to run up to you and get the story across. So. Yeah. I think it's very lucky for us to get all that free press during that time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Al, we saw the challenges imposed by the pandemic on most retailers and food establishments. What was the game plan in terms of adapting to these changes for Sweet Ecstasy? Man, the, the pandemic, I, I, you know, like a month or two uh, before it happened, uh, I did a food panel. I'm not unlike this one. And we weren't talking about 
adjusting to the pandemic because it hadn't happened yet. We were talking about sustainability and being environment friendly. <laughs> and for a while, we kind of, I'm not saying forget that, but then we've got new priorities. Um, I'm sure that most people attending today, uh, your lives like changed so much with the pandemic that has essentially indirectly brought you to this conversation today, you know, because you've now evolved into becoming maybe a, a, a food entrepreneur. And um, maybe that wasn't on your mind then, but for us who were like full on in the business, you know, we couldn't game plan for the, the pandemic, at least not in the beginning, you know, because it was, it was no man's land. And so what we did is what anybody would do, like going into a darkness or on an unknown territory. You, you stop what you're doing and then you put safety first. Uh, we don't even have time to think about like the sunk financial implications. So first thing we did was close down all our stores. And at the time we were operating five branches and we made sure that our employees could survive financially in the time that they weren't going to be working. And even when they got back to work, it wouldn't mean that they'd get their salaries. You know how salaries work. It takes a couple of weeks and things like that. So it was a time for us to not just do what the government mandates, but to tap into our reserves, which thank, you know, thank our blessings we had so that like immediately our people could pay for rent. They could buy, or buy, I don't even think rent was a problem. It was more like buy food, um, buy supplies for the home, you know, these things that we take for granted. Uh, while they were doing that, we needed to educate them and ourselves on what was really going on. So this means that every sort of information that was being thrown our way on the internet, some of it's good, some of it's bad. We had to sort of put all that together and make sure they understood sign of what was going on here. And then uh, since we had a month to be closed, uh, and I say a month because we decided to open at April 15, 2020, it gave us time to gauge honestly what other businesses were doing, very brave businesses who didn't know what they were doing, but they are brave enough to try. And so when we started operating, we put extreme safety measures in place, like extreme, like I, what I mean, like more than was probably necessary because we could always loosen up, but you don't want to be in a position where you're like just reacting on the heels of people getting sick. So you don't want to be reactive in times like this. You want to be ahead of the curve. And so as things progressed, you know, lockdowns opened up and everything, I feel it was very important to be constantly updated and not just with our LGUs, but what, what the world is doing so that we could do things like expand our store hours as we saw fit to start employing things like alfresco dine-in when we were ready. And we were ready very late in the game, even though we know we could do it. Just because we could see people was just because the LGU said 25% of the of the, our clients are allowed to eat in the restaurant doesn't mean you just do it. Uh, we waited till like December or January 22, 21 to start serving people in the restaurants. And I feel like being very, very conservative uh, with while still sticking to our guns where we could were the keys to sort of keeping stores from getting closed. And then in 2021, uh, putting an eye out towards opening new stores again, you know, beyond the ones we already have. So we are very, very lucky to be in the position where our food travels and is um, conducive to this new sort of delivery age. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm sure your employees are very grateful that you guys, you know, kept them at the top of your mind and took care of them during very trying times. And their family, yeah. Their family, yeah, they yeah. are they are family to you, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, the next question is for Adolfo. As a consultant to various food and beverage brands, can you share a few insights on some of the major pain points that brands come to you with? Hi, Margot. Hi. Last year was a, uh, a difficult year. Of course, the first three months were extremely difficult. It was short of saying it was a bloodbath. Um, and the pain points really beyond the, the normal, obvious um, overhead expenses, the constant rent, the, how the reduced sales transactions, these are all common across the board. But what's really, uh, what really defined 
all the point, main points of uh, most of the players are would be the, the ones that are intangible, specifically the, the emotional decisions, letting go of employees, not to let go. I mean, there's the, the rational part because you have to look at your financials. But uh, the fact that you have to let go of your 10-year-old, 20-year-old employees, these are all painful decisions. And of course, you're also looking at uh, mental health. Uh, a lot of guys, even if they try to look at rationally their financial statements, you're looking at um, the blank faces of where do we go from here? This is the first time we've uh, come across something like this. People who have seen the Asian economic crisis and other um, political and economic crisis in the past, this is really unique and different. And that's why you see a lot of uh, desperation and a lot of um, uh, emotion that go into it. People that usually would have the, the answers uh, for, for let's say the rising costs of uh, ingredients, raw materials, they're just staring at the blank wall. And um, I think that those are the painful part. Um, any entrepreneur faced with a decision to close, to open, not to close, and to delay opening, these are decisions not just based on your rational mind, but also on the emotion part, especially when it comes to uh, not just your own sake of uh, whether you can survive this or not, but really more of for the sake of your employees, your customers who are begging you not to close and um, begging, making sure that you get to hold on to um, have putting that uh, business together. These are all the pain points that uh, we, we came across last year. And sometimes you just have to, even if you, let's say, the uncertainty is there, you just have to tell them, Kaya to, you can proceed, you can move on, and then let's try to uh, look at it differently. And maybe there are other ways of uh, looking at things. So those are basically what we, we try to do. And as a consultant, we try to give as much free consultation and as much uh, pro bono consultations to everyone who needs help. And that's where Resto PH came about. We, we started forming this organization of uh, restaurant owners wherein we can give as much uh, information as we can so that nobody will be left behind. Nobody will end up being a, stat a statistic in the Department of Trade and Industry. So those are the things that uh, happened last year. That is amazing. Thank you, Adolfo. I, I know the food industry super thanks you for um, being part in leading that uh, effort. So thank you. Um, next question is for Carla. Pizulu was launched during the pandemic. How did you go about this and how do you harness influencer marketing to really help your food business stand out from competitors? So, um... I remember it was in the peak of ECQ. It was the, it was an intense lockdown and the only booming industry as we can see was food. There's so many brands popping here and there and you see you know food deliveries are actually making a bank in the market. So um uh, me and my sisters, we were all entre you know, we we're very entrepreneurial in spirit and we were having dinner one day and we were thinking what kind of food can we, what kind of food concept can we, um, can we do in a short span of time and that, you know, and people can have a new experience or a premium experience. So we thought of brick oven pizzas. So we saw that, you know, there, we want a new player in the category of brick oven pizzas. And that dinner, we decided to call it Pizzulu, which is pizza and Zoweta combined, yeah. um, their last names. Yeah. And Two months of R&D after we launched in a 30 square meter commissary um, inside the operative commissary. And we launched our first set of flavors and gave it to so many celebrities that we know in terms of the clientele also of operative who had a huge celebrity uh, following and clientele. So we gave them and people loved it. And they posted their pizzas on their Instagrams. And I think 
name it, they have posted it. Sharon Conetta, um, Marian Rivera. I don't want to drop some names. I don't want to name drop so much. But basically, um, you know, they were really game to post it. And um, again, we've got a lot of free um, Instagram uh, press that time. And uh, so Pizzulu launched around August. And around December, we saw the potential of the brand and we moved to a 600 square meter commissary. And we have already partnered with Grab Food, Food Panda from two chefs. Now we've grown to 13 staff wow. and counting. So it's been a wild ride and exciting ride for Pisulu. What an amazing growth throughout a pandemic. That's super inspiring. Um, thank you, Carla, for sharing that. Next question is for Steffi. No, we, we won't leave you out, Steffi. We, here, we got questions for you. Ready, ready. <laughs> so what's the story behind Lola Nana's Donuts? With so many international competitors who are more or less top of the mind when it comes to donuts, uh, what was the strategy to thrive? Um, I'll give a little background on, on Lola Nana's. We opened in 2012. My dad and I actually founded Lola Nana's in 2012. And we started with just selling our special peachy peachy and bottled items. At some point, we knew we needed to add more products for our customers. So in 2016, we added a full bakery line. Um, and we've had the donuts since 2016, but it kind of got its time to shine last year when we were forced to go on skeletal crew and go on a skeletal menu. And we were forced to just choose the items that we thought we could sell. Um, so one of those items were the donut, uh, the classic donut at that time. And my entire family held down the fort and we were the ones answering all, our, all the customers on Facebook, on Instagram. And we realized that they wanted more cheese in their donuts. And, and that's how the triple cheese donuts were born. So it was really from customer feedback and listening to them. Um, we, since we're a corner bakery, we're up in Adaria, we really never thought of ourselves as competition with you know the international brands we are a Filipino donut and that maybe that's kind of how we got our footing and and we were different in that way that we were the Filipino donut um so, so yeah we we got lucky for sure yeah and it's delicious oh my goodness guys thank you <laughs> I remember like the first time I take I take because Steffi and I were like best of friends and she made me taste yeah. it and I remember um, because I remember what I told didn't. you. I remember telling you the donut is going to be a, a big hit. It's going to be a billion peso. Carla was like, "This donut is going to be going to make you a billionaire," and I was just like, "Oh yeah, 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 yeah sure, sure." And you're always like, you know, all your friends are trying to hype you up. It's <laughs> and really then nice. so. So from, from being able to make a couple hundred donuts a day, um, we've been working really hard to be able to make more and expand our stores within the past year. So now we're able to make like 50,000 or 60,000 donuts a day. So we're, we're super blessed and we're super happy that we're able to do that. And hopefully we can like, you know, expand more. He's yeah. a car. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I people are starting to call me donut. I miss donut. I miss triple cheese donut. <laughs> No, it really is the, the darling of pandemic for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 2,000 donuts on a pandemic a day. That's just no, people, are, people are, you know, it's, it's, an, it's, it's essential. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> donuts definitely are essential. I have to yeah. agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have to agree. Um, for all of you, since we're kind of all in it right now, what are your tips um, on how budding foodpreneurs can thrive amidst the pandemic? If you guys give one tip off the top of your head, um, what would it be? Adolfo, well, before we, let's start. Oh, go, Al, go. Well, I, I <laughs> wanted to start with something that wasn't pandemic related, but more of a general reminder before everybody else kind of gives like these direct tips. I just wanted to say that, um, you know, just because it is a pandemic, being a startup, certain rules don't change. And before you think about adjusting to this situation, there's one thing that, at, that is at the core of this business and that's uh, simplicity. Um, I mean, I started in 2012 and I didn't even know things like CapEx. And then I look back at it and you know, my CapEx was 50,000 pesos. I had no money to start Sweet Ecstasy, but we started really simple. We built a foundation around something really good and something that we really believed in. And not because like I thought burgers trended or whatever, or because I think there's a demand for it. 
but I wanted to do something that I know I really, really believed in. So, and I, I say, start simple with this foundation. You don't just throw a lot of money out there and hope that something sticks because you need that money. You're going to, there's going to be a time yeah. once you're up and running where you're going to need all the money that you have. Yeah. And you don't have to give yourself additional like problems in the beginning, because don't worry, you're going to have plenty of problems <laughs> as your business <laughs> Keeps, keeps going. Definitely. So I just wanted to remind people that before worrying about how it happens pandemic wise, all things start the same way. There we go. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. What I want to add, um, I think it's for me, it's really doing like what I'm doing. I really love it. So, so there's no chance for me to really burn out because I like doing it. Yeah. Um, so if you like what you're doing, because the entrepreneurship, um, putting up a business, food business, it takes a lot of hours. And if you don't like what you're doing, you're definitely going to get burned out before you get the chance to even, you know, succeed. So like it, enjoy it so that you don't get burned out. And you're actually, you know, creating stuff that you like and like people can, can feel that. And, um, you know, they like that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Also being, you know, very creative. Like I, I am not a chef. I don't even know how to bake anything. But, <laughs> but basically, Vertif is a, you know, a pastry, a pastry brand. So it's also being resilient and innovative and smart. You know, playing it smart also. So if you have like an idea, you you know the right people who can, you know, maneuver it and execute it well. Then there you go. You have you have something. Yeah, I Connect agree with that dots. because. When, when we wanted to put a bakery line, I did not know how to make bread. So I went to um, baking classes and I made like so much bread and I just ate carbs all the time so that I could like make this donut. And then, and then now it's here. So you just gotta, you have to try and learn and don't be afraid to like do new things and try yeah. new things. Yeah. I think um, what you mentioned is really uh, what's, what's happening right now. If I were to summarize it, um, I, my constant advice to the budding and the startups, because prior to pandemic, I was coaching and uh, consulting for the chains, the established brands. But when the pandemic happened, I got exposed more and more to uh, startups. And uh, to survive, I think you need to make a lot of tough decisions, tough calls. And that's when a lot of um, you have to set aside a lot of uh, emotions. But to thrive, the question is, how do you thrive? All three mentioned the, the, some of the operative words would be, and I'd like to summarize it into three, eat, E-A-T. Experiment, experiment, and which is another way of uh, doing innovation, which I think um, Carla did, Steffi did, uh, they mentioned about that. And when you experiment, last year, the buzzword the, was pivot. You have to pivot, you have to innovate and push it as much as you can. Push the envelope up, up, up to where can I uh, see this brand uh, developing and uh, innovating. And A, of course, is austerity. Um, Al mentioned about uh, keeping it simple and never mind that you have, uh, you don't have to constantly look at your FS, but you keep your your inventory small. Therefore, if you have a smaller in inventory, uh, small menu leads to smaller inventory, and therefore um, lower food cost. And I think uh, Steffi also mentioned that those are the key ingredients. Uh, and then the letter T stands for technology. E A T technology is uh, really the name of the game right now. You, I, I've seen. Foodpreneurs, entrepreneurs who are resisting the idea of I don't, I'm not techie, I don't know how AI works, um, uh, how do I promote in IG? I, I saw one of the questions right now. How do I make my brand um, more viral? You have to embrace technology, and technology doesn't necessarily mean you have to spend a lot of money because there's a lot of free apps there there's a lot of partners that you can do uh, do business with if you if you simply digitize some parts of the business so remember eat you have to eat experiment austerity and technology i 
love it. And I think we all love to eat. I, I probably could speak for everyone <laughs> yeah. here. Eating is definitely something we love doing. Um, again, for everyone, what are some of the major changes you've seen throughout this pandemic um, in your target consumers? You want me to go first? <laughs> go, go for ahead. it. Yes, please. Uh, with, with Upper Teeth, we've always tapped the premium upscale market. And 80% of our sales back then were derived from catering and events. So it's the whole wedding industry, the corporate events industry. So imagine and up until now, we're still not doing events. Um, even when the ECQ was lifted before, we didn't tap events because of the safety of our staff. So for me, um, I wouldn't want to tap events until the vaccines are out and until you know we've had herd immunity. So we're still we're we're sticking to the delivery, you know, the the boxing industry and the delivery industry. So um, so we had a transition from events to tapping a more, more massive market who needs food every day and who needs pastries or cakes in their special occasions. So that means for us, you know, a new product line. I think we have launched around 15 new products during the pandemic and um, continuing to innovate, especially again in the pastry industry, it's very competitive. It's very trendy also. People want something new all the time. So we're in a constant lookout for what's trending and how do we make it, um, you know, have that upper T factor, that that X factor that could stand out among all the all the players in in the market. Um, so one way for us to tap a bigger client was, um, I remember we had a product called the Ui Gooey Cookies, and I remember I wanted to tap a bigger market for this. So I was thinking. I wanted to put it in Family Mart. Um, so I woke up one day and um, I told myself I want our ooey gooey cookies in Family Mart. And I'm a huge believer of law of attraction. And 30 minutes after the marketing manager of Family Mart called me and told me if my cookies were in Family Mart. And that for me was an instant yes. And 8,000 cookies every month were, were you know, were sold in Family Mart. Until now, we're still with Family Mart, and we're in thirty branches of Family Mart with our cookies. So it's been a really good partnership with them. So another thing, as an entrepreneur, and not just during the pandemic, is if you have something in mind. Well, I got lucky because the universe gave me a blessing right away. But if if the if the marketing manager of Family Mart didn't call me, I would be the first one to call them, and really, you know scout for their number, you know, connect me to this person or whatsoever. So do whatever you can do. If you have a good idea, ask, ask not, and you shall receive. Yes. Ask, ask if you want to, if they want free pizzas, ask if they can yeah. post this online, ask if, if family Mart is interested in your cookies, you never know. So mm -hmm. there you, you go. Ask, the answer will always be no. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's always worth trying. It's always there's another, always, there's always. another phrase I think works for uh, today's event. Closed mouths don't get fed. Right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you get rejected, if, if it's a no, then it's fine. You got your answer. But at least you tried, you know? Absolutely. Um, what about you, Steffi? As far as Lola Nenas, um, how did you see a change in your target consumers? Um, our target consumers changed in general. So overnight from having um, customers that line up and buy, you know, a piece of bread or a piece of um, a box, one box of peachy peachy, because they were commuters. Now, nobody commutes and everybody just drives in, buys or gets delivery. Now from like two pieces, now they're buying like boxes and boxes of these donuts. But what we saw that didn't actually change was the, you know, customers looking for value of value for money. So yung sulat factor is always what we're going for. And when somebody orders and they get the food, you want them to be like, ay, sobrang sulit nito. Mm -hmm. We want that feeling na parang, it's so good. It only costs this much. How? How? Why wouldn't I buy this? So that's kind of like where, where we're coming from. We want it to always be sulit and delicious, of course. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay, awesome. And Al, 
Oh, you're muted. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> I could I could have answered Stephanie Stephanie's answer for her for her in the <laughs> pandemic. Her customer base <laughs> changed from hundreds to thousands to millions. Millions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exiting the group but, now. <laughs> but you know, um, going back to what Carla was saying about like uh, trending in in regards to uh, the evolving customer base, you know, since last year, uh, our feeds, our customers' feeds, is like their TV now. Are there five, yeah. 10, 15 minutes? Uh, manual TV. This is how we change uh, channels. For hours. And, uh, <laughs> for hours pala. Yeah. And so um, they're, they're there and you know what? They're looking. They're looking. They're hunting even if they don't know they're doing that. And they're hunting to, you know, guess what? And this, this is what I want budding entrepreneurs to know. They're hunting for ways to spend money. Okay? Yes. Uh, even though it's reasonable to assume that times are hard in the pandemic, and that they'll be tight with their money, but our target consumers are more than ever willing to pay for happiness. They're willing to pay for escapism, this way to get out of the house without leaving the house. And they're also ready and willing to pay to discover new things. So even though you're not a brand right now, um, you got this startup thing going out of your house. If it is on, if it finds their way on their feed and it looks really good, which I'm sure you're going to find a way to make that happen, then they're going to be willing to try, especially if someone they know says that your product is worth discovering. So I think that is this thing that you're going to have to do to put it out there, but they're, they're going to try. And we will go, we'll talk later about what's going to happen after they try, you know, to get them <laughs> to keep trying. <laughs> For sure. What was that, Adolfo? That was, uh, it's like revenge travel. And then, uh, people, it's revenge eating. Revenge. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, you as a, as a food um, consultant, you know, yes. for the businesses that you work with? First and foremost, yes, thank you, Margot. First and foremost, uh, safety is uh, utmost in the minds of consumers, whether you're doing takeout delivery and to a certain extent, even dine in. How, no matter how limited. And some of those that I, I saw who had a, who were trying very hard to reopen after the closure in March of last year, had this uh, idea that if we put safety protocols in place, it will cost us a lot of money and our employees is our primary concern. And therefore, if they're not safe, my customers are not safe. So safety, I think, is important across the board. Everyone is thinking about how do we get safe food uh, delivered by safe riders, etc. So number one, safety. A is aspirational. I think that's what happened to uh, brands like Aperitif and uh, even uh, Lola Nenas. No? So people are trying to aspire for something, and that's where the revenge uh, dining uh, comes about. I know of this uh, foodpreneur. Uh, it's called Amaze and Grace. Uh, she started out uh, having a chain of uh, salons and apparel. And because of the pandemic, nobody was buying stuff because you're just wearing your pambahay clothes every day. So therefore, she had to pivot. And she rediscovered her love for baking. And because she knew that the market she wanted to target was the, uh, the, the ones that aspire for something better, so what she did was she reinvented macarons. She did uh, chocolate coated strawberries and uh, again, created this platter of desserts. It's really affordable indulgence and that's uh, aspiration. V is value for money. I think uh, I'll mention this um, and even Steffi about the suited factor. Uh, people are looking for a uh, the big, bigger bang for the buck. So therefore, I saw this foodpreneur, he got retrenched. Uh, he, he had to leave Boracay as an ex executive chef. So when he arrived in Manila, created Slow Burn Manila. Slow Burn Manila creates the surf and turf platter of which you have uh, shrimps and uh, baby back ribs on a bed of umami rice with uh, French beans and uh, cherry tomatoes. Ordering that. I know I'm like trying to wipe the drool off my face. 
for what is the handle? You have food for four. And that's really value for money. So people are looking at, wow, this is uh, something that I can eat during special occasions, but it's, it costs so much less than the normal. So if you divide, divide it by four, it's only 250 pesos per, per person. It's more and expensive that, pa, to make that at home. Yeah, yeah true. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But to put that together, of course, you have to yeah. buy the tomatoes. Yeah. The what is it called again? What is the brand name? <laughs> Slow, slow burn, burn manila. At, <laughs> no. at slow burn manila. Slow burn oh, manila. Slow burn. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Is this your client? You better let them know that you're getting a lot of people to follow. <laughs> All the way to now. Yes. I just had, uh, I, I saw it uh, the first time in October and I, I fell in love with it. So right now it's my go to for, uh, for family gatherings. And then, of course, O is online experiences. Prior to today, prior to pandemic, I was, I do a lot of on-site, uh, on-site training for on-site experiences, of course, the guest experience. So therefore, I think you need people, uh, our new entrepreneurs would need to replicate that and create an online experience. You cannot be too impersonal by allowing technology to take over. Initially, I think you need to be able to demonstrate and do the, the hard knocks because you're a startup. And finally, R, I think Al mentioned this, our customers nowadays, because of the availability of so many options, that's why you have a lot of copycats, Carla, they're so relentless. They relentlessly look for new options. But even then, when, when they look and they get disappointed, they go back to the brands that they are happy with. So relentlessness is another one. So if you put that together, that's S-A-V-O-R, you need to be able to, you see a lot of consumers creating this savor type of um, attitude right now. Yeah, awesome. That's great. A lot of great insight. Um, so again, for all of you, how has the pandemic affected your business? What were some of the low hanging fruit that you guys reached and leveraged to help stay afloat? Al, would I, you like um, to go? Yeah, always. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, we're all, we were all going to be affected. This was a given. Um, there's no way because, because nobody's outside and, um, just everything, everything looks and feels different. So what was the way, what was the way that we were going to still kind of maintain presence for people that were at home? That was going to happen from the platforms, the delivery platforms that exist already that are on people's minds and on people's phones and make their lives easier. Now we could, we could all see that the, the margins that uh, it costs us to use, let's say, as a restaurant to serve our food through Grab Food and Food Panda. It takes a lot out of our profit margin, but it's a profit margin that we only have because we're using them. You know, yeah. I don't don't give me a hundred percent of nothing. You know, hey, let me give you twenty five percent. And let me keep 75% of a whole lot of thing, especially in times like this. If I, if my priority is keeping my, my employees fed and working and healthy and safe, then I need to give them something to do. And the best way to keep us busy and going right now is to make less profit while keeping ourselves on the minds of everybody during this pandemic through the platforms Nah, because the last thing I want is someone else to become your favorite burger. Okay. <laughs> I don't want you to think we're slipping. I don't want you to think we're out here. So I know we lost some of our, you know, our, our, our profit percentage over the past year, but I'll gladly exchange that for still getting to churn out tons of burgers a day and still being a part of everybody's lives. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Steffi, how about you? Um, we were, because of the pandemic, we were really forced to find ways for customers to see us. Um, before people that bought from us are commuters, people that would see us on the streets. Really, that was our only way to be seen, being out on the streets. 
And the moment where when people weren't allowed to be out on the streets, oh my gosh, how are good people going to even remember us? And they need to see you and remember you to buy from you. So we were forced to um, be on social media and put ourselves out there and you know, introduce ourselves to people because if people don't know about you, how will they buy from you, like I said? So it's a constant reminder of who we are, constant bombarding of like, this is what we sell, this is what we have, this is how you can eat our food, this is how you can order. Um, so the pandemic really forced us to be on the internet, which we weren't before. Um, like I said earlier, we, we are a mom and pop, we were a mom and pop panaderia that I didn't know belonged on the internet, but you know, a year in, we really belong on the internet. I feel like we're even on TikTok. This Lola is on TikTok. So, so yeah, um, we were forced to be on the internet and then now we're here. Awesome. Awesome. And Carla, how about you? I think for us is also, you know, we are frontliners. Like our, our chefs, our, our, the, the, our staff, in the commissary, they're all frontliners. Every day they're risking their lives. Can you imagine the amount of grab drivers you're exposed to and food panda drivers yeah. and you know, in and outs of people. So just that alone is like so different pre-pandemic. So you're like risking, risking your your crew also, but they have to work at the same time. It's a risk for them. So um the overhead for us is so high in terms of like providing transportation providing lodging, providing COVID testing every two weeks um, for them, disinfection of the whole commissary. We all have to do that. Those are all additional costs compared to pre-pandemic days. So now all of our staff, they're, they're not even allowed to take transportation, public transportation. We had to allot, there are no cars for them and they have they, 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 the drivers have to pick them up, bring them home all the time. So that even alone is, you know, something that you have to, think of as an entrepreneur and can you actually afford to do that when you open you know safety is top priority right now so so there it's and it's not really something it's not something that you can really add on to your selling price you know you also want to price yeah. your and your product yeah, well so you know you want to do all these things and you know be as safe as you can but you also have to think about okay am I going to survive by doing this yeah kind yeah. of thing yeah, those are the the painful questions Adolfo mentioned yeah. earlier yeah. that a lot of businesses have to ask themselves. Um, Adolfo, was there anything else you wanted to add? You know, yeah. um, maybe you saw with your clients any anything they anything they leveraged to stay afloat. I have seen the reluctance of most of uh, people I've, uh, I got in touch with to to get into the to compete in a different ball game because the rules of uh, the ball game have changed. Mm -hmm. And I think um, even if they tried to look for low hanging fruits, it became higher and higher. The fruits are unreachable. Right. And therefore some managed to take the plunge, but some are really very scared. I saw one pizza uh, restaurant in Quezon City who only opened after seven months after the quarantine happened. So there were a lot of um, inter introspection and I think uh, whether on a personal uh, note or professionally, people took the time to be able to do a lot of um, soul searching. Is this meant for me? Um, am I meant to be a foodpreneur? Um, can I really do this with passion alone? Uh, what's happening to my bottom line? Those questions. So you start, I think there was a lot of um, um, uh, seeking quest uh, answers for very difficult questions. Instead of uh, looking for, for some, instead of looking for where do I get my next big sale, some simply took back, uh, took a few steps back and makes, made sure that when they are ready, they will be stronger than ever. Um, those are the, the type of uh, players I've seen last year. Awesome. Okay, yeah. Um, it's always good to take a step back when you're not sure. Um, and another question for everyone, post-pandemic, how do we see food businesses change? Do we see consumers coming back to brick and mortar a lot or will it be a hybrid approach? 
or will we still be uh, digital, uh, digital, very focused on digital? What do you guys think? All of the above. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the thing. Um, delivery has uh, sort of uh, wedged itself into our, our, our lives. It's a thing. It's replaced family home cooked meals by a lot. Yeah. Uh, except for the really ambitious sort of like people who have that Ghana and willingness to cook at home. But um, that's me. Yeah. Right. You're still doing <laughs> keeping the keeping the um, drive got alive. It. But, got it. but for the <laughs> um, but at the same time, culturally, deep down inside, we want to get out. We want to break free and we want to be with our friends and family outside again. So when this herd immunity happens and, you know, we get post pandemic if that's such a thing yet we don't know but when it, if it does then there's going to be the added dining and eating out presence that we've been missing the last year or so and i think that people can look at that as added opportunity i really highly believe in what al said you know filipinos are into gatherings and we all miss dining out the experience of dining out is so different from eating something not fresh from the kitchen, but fresh yeah. from your driver, you know, it's so yeah. different. And, you know, just being with friends and family, dressing up and going out, it's, it's, it's like, it, that's always part of the Filipino culture, being together in a place and gathering and celebrating. So social media will always be there. It will always be a strong channel for your business. Hotlines, grab, there, at least you already experience it. Um, people who has not tried food delivery before, I'm sure they have already experienced it during the lockdown. So it will always be there. But I highly believe in the fact that restaurants are going to boom, malls are going to be open again, the bars are going to, you know, are are going to rise and and um, open. So I'm very very optimistic about it, and I see I see that once the economy opens once we've had herd immunity sky's the limit for the food the food industry yeah i i i definitely agree i mean as much as you know we've gotten the habit of ordering out um ordering from grab or like just doing takeout i myself wish i mean miss i definitely miss like sitting in front of people and eating yeah. in front of them cuz now you know you can kind of eat out but you have to do the whole like yeah, thing. The whole barrier. And, then, and then you have to like look at each other with side eye while eating and it's just like not as fun as seeing each other face to face and eating and like mm -hmm. I can't wait and I'm sure a lot of people or maybe everybody feels the same way that like the moment we're allowed to like I can't wait to be out there eating with friends and family so yeah definitely hybrid we'll still be ordering out we'll still be doing all that stuff but we'll definitely also be out eating with our friends and family I agree I agree. Uh, before the pandemic, the, the business is really an 80-20, 90-10 type of uh, transaction. About 80 to 90 percent would be your dine-in, about 10 to 20 percent would be your takeout delivery. And, but now things have changed. I think it's more because of protocols and because of restrictions, it became the other way around. But post-pandemic, it will be a mix of uh, both the dine-in, the physical face-to-face, -face, plus the takeout delivery uh, business. Because there's a lot of some costs and it, a lot of apps have occupied already your mobile phone, you don't want them to go to waste. Yeah. And we're so confident already, the, the trust issues have been uh, shattered. Um, it's already, we have this relationship with our apps and you have your favorite uh, go-to. So these are the things yeah. that uh, will probably not go away, but it will augment the desire to dine in and do a lot of, uh, but um, I think I've talked to some of the chains and if there's one thing that will definitely change, it's the amount of space that uh, our, our restaurant uh, owners will be uh, leasing. Yeah. Uh, so the, Gone are the days where you would have about 200, 300 seating capacity. You would probably scale down from 100 seats to less. 
So you'd be happy if uh, people would want to have a good mix of uh, 20 to 30 seating capacity plus a good uh, kitchen to be able to service your uh, delivery clientele. Oh, what is so, that? We're, okay. all, we're all trying to ask him questions. Yeah. I just want to pick your brain. Right? Like, what, what, but why would you want to scale down when you already have, you know, herd immunity and stuff? I, I, I just want to know more about it. Anything can happen. Um, a lot of our predictions about what's the next virus. Are we prepared for that? And if you have already people are getting used to being able to uh, dine in at home instead of going out, there will be a good mix. And obviously, the ones who have the infrastructure, structurally, you have already the, the big venues. So let's not uh, allow that to go to waste. Would but, you have clients now that are downsizing? Yes. Have, are yeah. sure. I'm sure, yeah. Oh yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't see any short-term future for like a big fancy restaurant. The ones we used to love to go, I mm -hmm. think that's going to take a lot longer, just like with the bars and the yeah. other social environments that we right. know of. But Las Vegas is already open and it's, it's the same as before. Like well, before. Las Vegas was the same in the beginning of pandemic. <laughs> they were the last to like react but you know yeah, they, it was it, they it, it. Their <laughs> changed at all yeah <laughs> it's their crazy governor <laughs> <laughs> um okay so lola nenas is a purely takeout store so should am i expecting to for some dine-in in the next few years or, or, or what are we expecting here <laughs> you're busy, too busy to be counting your millions of donuts <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> Don't go in Okay, okay, got it, got it, got it. <laughs> you, you I love how you guys tip. are getting tips from Adolfo. <laughs> Steffi, to have the model you have and know that it it's at its best, the way it is already for you is it puts you in a rare and very fortunate position. Yes. I'd love yeah. to not have to have customers worry or have the option yeah. of where they're going to eat their food. They know they want to bring your food home. They want, they don't even want to wait for that. They want to eat it in the car or on their bike or whatever. Yeah. yeah so, so drive through. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. I mean, that's when that's what we're seeing right now you're seeing yeah. these really smart standalone things being popped up out of like shipping containers like crispy cream yeah. and yellow yeah. cab and duncan yeah. and i saw brothers burgers got some good ones that you're you're already set up like that, I love that but you'll see i think the opportunity for you to do that more provincially down the line because it's such okay, an affordable go, model I'm, 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 I'm riding with you on this. Let's go, let's go. Yes. I think Steph, We're going to see it. Look at the business model of Mary Grace. Mary Grace started as a, a cheese kiosk. and Saimada kiosk. Yeah. And went into full dining. Yeah. Nothing will stop you from experimenting, from pivoting, yeah. from full takeout delivery to probably do just one dining restaurant. Why not, yeah. right? Because you have the luxury to be able to um, experiment and innovate. And that's how but you know, Mary Grace was never on the road and you are. And that's like the biggest strength. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, a road, yeah. You've got these roadside billboards everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. We that's kind of like what, what we're going for. We really want to be on the road. Easy come and go. You know, you're not scared yeah. that you're, you have to go into a mall. Um, you're just going to park buy your food and get out of there and eat at home so you even have some comfort, boxes you know? in your background so <laughs> yeah that, that, you know, right you're there. ready to eat <laughs> yes <laughs> um that's great i love it um so right now some final thoughts on how food business can survive and thrive you know um from your experiences i guess what's one tip you guys each um want to share with everyone Oh, I, I remember we were speaking to Adolfo. I don't know if it was brought up on this conversation on this panel tonight, but I remember Adolfo mentioning how pivotal the social media groups online are, like like Resto.ph for the restaurant tours, for example, the Let's Eat Pares and everything for the awareness for everybody else. Um, for all of us, from the startups to the 
people who have been like doing this for a little bit longer, our key to survival is not in battling against each other and competing against each other. We're already fighting against something bigger than ourselves, yeah. but rather for us to sort of depend and learn and evolve from each other, sharing markets, sharing uh, innovations, um, by and really being open to something beyond the way you've always been doing it because you whatever you've been doing has no um, relevance or a point of reference in the today and the now. Mm, so seeing what other people are doing and thinking, hey, how can this work for me? Whether I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I, I see what Adolfo is doing with these really big restaurants and Carla is doing really nicely on this sort of visual social media level and how Steffi can show you that you can start with one market, but then you could end up encompassing all of them <laughs> by adapting. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Steffi. So to piggyback, to piggyback on that, um, you know, the only reason we were able to adapt was really by listening. And if we weren't the ones manning the fort and listening to the customers ourselves, I'm not sure if we would be in this position now. So it's really being able to listen to what the customer wants and not necessarily just following them, but like trying to figure out, okay, this is what they want. How can this work for us? And how can we roll it out so that they, they can get it and appreciate it? So, so yeah, listening to the customers is, is very big for us. Awesome. And Carla, what about you? For me, in the industry of pastries and cakes and events, it's really innovation because it's such a fast changing market. You know, there's always something new all the time. People always want something new, something better, something more pretty, something more cheap. And there's always something popular. So for us, it's a constant immersion to what's out there and what can be, what can be another thing to reintroduce to the market. So just keep on innovating. If you are in the bakery industry or events or celebrations industry, that's really the way to go. I agree. And I think if there are two case studies that we can learn from, it's really what Al mentioned. One is the rest of the age. We're in formerly competitors now bonding together, helping. And our collaborators now. Collaborating, that's right. Yeah. And the second one is the community pantry. And the common denominator of the two, between the two uh, concepts, the, collab the consortium of restaurants and the community pantry is the big K, kindness. I think we need to be kind, especially that um, yes. we're all in this together. That's a cliche, but uh, we, kept, uh, we cannot just build a, a one big happy B or a big letter M dominating. <laughs> I mean, we all have to survive and to be able to do that, we need to be able to exercise kindness. The community pantry showed us that, that we can achieve kindness and rest of the age show that we can be uh, comfortable sleeping with the enemy, comfortable um, learning from each other, um, learning the ropes, um, getting a lot of uh, leverage talking to suppliers and to uh, mall owners together as a group. That's very important. Wow, what a great way to end our panel discussion proper. Kindness, kindness, definitely key um, as we further our aspirations in the food industry. So thank you again to all our pan panelists for sharing your own experiences with us. Now, at this point, we'd like to call out some of the questions that were asked and, and do a Q&A through our audience. Um, so again, guys, as we continue, you can share some last minute questions. Um, but to begin with, I think this one probably can be answered by Carla and Adolfo. Um, do you prefer to start many businesses all at once um, or given that you have the extra money and capital for it or just focus on one? Um. During the pandemic, I started Hizulu, Fast Lab, Villa Vicente, and we just launched Fast Clean last week, and we're launching another villa this month. So I've launched five brands in the whole pandemic season. So I don't know if you can do it, then do it. 
that's really for me. Um, if you have great partners, if you have a good idea, I told myself I will never get involved in the COVID testing business, but but we've launched Fast Lab, which is a drive-through COVID testing site, and it's doing pretty good. So um, never say never. If you have a good, if you have, if you think that there's potential in the market, if you have the energy for it, if you have the passion to do it and the right partners and the right state of mind, mental state, why not? But if you think that you're, you know, if you're, if you can focus on one thing, that's better. For me, when I launch brands, I, I like, at least I try to launch them, you know, one by one. And, you know, after one month, you launch another one, but launching them simultaneously, I am, um, it takes a lot of skill and practice, but if, but I've launched five during the pandemic. So for me, um, I hope that inspires someone out there. Yeah, yeah. Carla is an outlier. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I kind of have to agree with that sentiment. Adolfo. Cool. You are the exception to the rule, Carla. I was just thinking of all the opportunities I can, you know. But now when I think yeah. about it, like, oh my God, I have to stop. But it's like, you know, I, I enjoy making brands. So if you love making brands, then let's right. go for it. Yeah. I, I wanted to be the way Carla is right now. I remember once we started doing Sweet Ecstasy and I think part of it was, I mean, yes, I think more businesses, more money, but more than that, I, I think the first initial problems we had, I wanted to escape them. And I thought that maybe adding more businesses were going to give me less problems, but just trying to start them up caused me more of them. And I realized because I'm a one trick pony here with the Sweet Ecstasy, I realized that only when I put my mind and, and my, my, my efforts solely on this one thing, and this was after five or six years of doing it, when we were truly committed to this one thing, especially because we are not experts in this business, when I could just focus on learning and growing in this one thing that we can, but then I saw our business grow. I saw the numbers grow. I saw the product improve. And that isn't the case for everyone either, but because I don't have a, I don't have a team of people who are experts in this field. And I, I really, at the end of the day, I know I can only rely on myself. Then my capacities lie within just doing one thing and making it as successful and as good as it, as it can be. And then maybe then, maybe then I could look for others, but if it's really that great and it's, it's this passion you have for something, then see, really truly see how far it goes yeah awesome I, yeah i think carla is a different animals because i would have to advise otherwise during normal times it's okay to do five ten brands and launch it during normal times but because these are, are uncertain days and abnormal uh, circumstances i would advise that you take it one at a time. I, I mentioned Slow Burn Manila and really the surf and turf concept, the platter, took on maybe about uh, three, six months before they added another variation. And it's the same concept. From surf and turf, they went to turf and turf. And they went to surf and surf. I mean, it, it's still focusing on platter, it's still focusing on one concept, but trying to make variations of the same concept. The tendency is that if you start creating, let's say, a new business, for example, a donut compared to a, uh, a meal concept, then maybe that you might be taking your eye off the ball, resources-wise, energy-wise. And because Carla is so young, she may have all the energy. She's very young. She's in her late 20s or so. Right. So maybe we'll keep it in the late 20s. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really um, an important factor to consider. Uh, but then again, KFC was uh, created by a man who was in the 70s. Who knows, right? But again, he had to stick it out with one big idea, one concept at a time. That every like multi multi conglomerate big business that we inspire like max's group or uh, foodie or something 
everyone we aspired to, they didn't get to that point, throwing a bunch of restaurants out there. They hit a home run with one, maybe two. And from there, you can build as many as you'd like. And even then, when you have many, there's a lot of misses. And you don't want to just run one really successful one to keep the rest of them afloat because they're saying your success and saying your efforts. Absolutely. Okay, the next question is from Janine Ligad. She says, hello, what's your business marketing advice to reach more people? How do you make your brand known in your area? Let's start with the TikTok queen, <laughs> Steffi. I mean, you want to share? TikTok. Yeah, um, love TikTok. Yeah, TikTok. <laughs> um, uh, so, so we just started social media last year, really. And getting into Facebook and Instagram is pretty hard. Instagram, especially because, you know, the algorithm of Instagram is if the people aren't following you, then they won't see your posts. And if they're following you, only 10% of the people following you will see your posts. So they're not going to see you unless you pay. And at that time, we had nothing to pay. <laughs> so we were like, okay, what do we need to do? So I was doing a bit of research and I was trying to see what are the social media platforms that you know, we can be seen without having to pay. And one of them was really TikTok because back then there weren't as much content creators on there. So the way TikTok is built, if, if you guys don't know, is that it stays on the For You page. So when you go to TikTok, it stays on the For You page. So you don't really see the people you're following. You see whatever algorithm, whatever TikTok wants you to see. And if you are a new brand and you make good content and people like it, then TikTok is going to show it to more people, people that don't follow you and people that don't know you. And the more eyes that see you, the more sales you get. So just by doing TikTok, we got a lot of new customers from that. Um, you know, of course, Facebook and Instagram ads and like really figuring out how to, how to leverage those and how to um, really pinpoint. And you know, a lot of this I've, I learned in, in Google University and everything you can learn <laughs> from that, but it's really putting hours in and, and putting hours in and learning and putting hours in and actually doing it yourself. And it's not something that you can just, pwede mo lang utos to whoever. You know, it's your brand. Like for me, I'm really the ones figuring, I'm really the one figuring it out. I'm really the one doing it. Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah. Carla, do you have any? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, you're asking oh, yeah, me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think like since social media is a free market, there are so many strategies out there where in content creation is king. So like us, we've never done billboards or TV ads, but then just study study players who are already doing it and just see what is their strategy for creating such visual content. Like us also, um, we shoot um, quite often with my team and making, you know, really creative content and seeing what content will work and what content will not work, what content can viral. So there's a lot of effort in, in content creation and it's not just photos. It's really like high quality visual Video. content. Yeah. 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 Um, Al or Adolfo, do you have anything else to add? Go ahead, Adolfo, please, please. You're going to say something and I'm not going to say much at all about this. <laughs> well, I think it's important that um, we do a lot of... Um, okay. Uh, I have S. S uh, for, for me, it's Steffi. important. Sample, sample, <laughs> sample. Um, oh, I, I receive a lot of samples from budding entrepreneurs. And after receiving the samples, two things can happen. Either I like it or I don't like it. And chances are, I'm not just talking about going sampling to influencers. I think you need to be able to convince people that your product stands out, right? So for you to be able to uh, stand out, you need to be able to keep it simple and at the same time be able to uh, see that there's value in the new, in the product that they're sampling. So, that's the best way. Um, whether you're using social media or not, word gets around. A good product, you cannot put down a good product. So you do heavy, heavy sampling. And then word will definitely uh, 
go around with it, whether you uh, your product sucks because some some are very emotional when you create something. Oh, I have the best dinuguan, I have the best kare kare. But chances are, if you fit, you try to pit it against the the rest of those uh, restaurants offering the same product, then you drown. Mm. You drown in the clutter of all this. Uh, all those who try to offer the same product. So sample, 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 and that's uh, hopefully will uh, get you to rise above the clutter. Nice, nice. Well, I think one more thing, can I add, can I add something real quick? Um, I think she's asking, how do you get your brand known? I think a big thing now that maybe not a lot of people really think about, or not a lot of entrepreneurs think about is packaging, because um, for Lola Nenas, when we started packaging our, our boxes so that they're Instagrammable and when you open it, people can take a video and post and tag you. That's the time when people were actually tagging us because before that, you know, our packaging was just like a white box. So if they're taking a photo of it, nobody would know where that came from. So you also have to think about like how the product looks. Um, yes, it's just, you know, a 27 peso donut, but people are excited and want to post about it. And if your packaging is not that good, then, then they not, might not even post it at all or tag you at all. Absolutely. We always get tagged with Pizzulu yeah. pizza yeah. box. And we took yeah. so much work on that pizza box. We even had yeah. an art draw the, the whole box and the outline of the box. So, um, you know, people, I've seen people tag us with, you know, layouts with their babies holding the pizza box. Yeah. And- proposal and then there's a pizza box of pizzulu or a date night and the blogger is like a whole date night um set table set up and pizzulu is there so it's like i never see these with this this kind of initiative for you to tag a yeah. pizza box. I, yeah. i've never i've always ordered pizza pizza before but i've never tagged pizza online you know, we don't we don't ask people to tag but then they feel so, the need to share to other people that yeah. you know so whenever we stuff. create brands right now the first thing really in mind is like how can people tag it because when you tag it yeah. it's instant word of mouth it's instant spread in social it's instant networking so we yeah. always put that into consideration even with a pretty um, is this Instagram worthy? That's the best question. Even with the resort that we owned, um, that we launched, it, it's like, is is this corner Instagram worthy? Is this, it's, that's like a big question. So, so if you're starting to have a food brand in mind, how can you make Kare Kare Instagram worthy? How can yeah. you make a Instagram work worthy? Try to put that in mind. And when you have an answer, then try to see what's 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 being done out there. That's how you get to to stand out from the crowd of kare kare and adobo and you know yeah. sushi bake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And have yeah. your brand on the box. Yeah. yeah. I think your brand's cre- created a new word in the dictionary. It's called unboxing. <laughs> yes. When people yeah. take videos of the exactly. unboxing. Exactly. And because of what you uh, mentioned, there's always a good story to tell. I think storytelling has to happen. I agree. Yeah. When I get samples and I couldn't relate the brand right, right. to the product, Food. so I had to ask, so what's the story? Mm-hmm. Is, this, yeah. is it heirloom? Is, it, is, is this handed down from one generation to another? Are you getting your ingredients from the farmers of Tarlac? So we have to be able to tell the story so that when people try to attach a story to your brand, a, a tried and tested dish like kare kare, then they would know that this kare kare came from a, uh, a storyteller named um, uh, Al Gala, Al Zero. They're <laughs> <laughs> really in a visual generation, you know, the, the, oh, yeah. the market is very, very visual. It's yes. so aspirational. Everyone wants to Instagram any, you know, something that they're proud of. And at the yeah. end of the day, it's, it, that's, that's visual packaging and experience wise is all part of your brand. Yeah. So the more, pe- more eyes see your, bo- I'm sorry, Al, the more I no, see no, your no, box no. And, and your name, um, I imagine in the future, you know, we're going to have, you know, we're not going to be ordering on our phones. We're going to use voice, right? So, you know, if I don't work on my brand now, people are just going to be like, 
Siri, can I order donuts? But instead, they're going to be ordering, Siri, can I order Lola Nena? So that's why I feel like you, you, know, you really need to work on your brand right now because it's co- that's coming soon. I think voice is coming very, very soon. Technology, technology, yeah. eat. That was the last part of eat. Yeah. <laughs> Al, wh- what did you have to say as far as, um, you know? Sorry, bro. Yeah. No, no, I know. <laughs> it's, it's really good, actually. I, I hear you guys also because I'm coming from a place where I'm really, I'm really bad at marketing. I, I, I have, I, I, <laughs> it gives me anxiety. I, I, I'm scared of posting. I don't know how to, I'm not good at it. And I feel like there's going to be people who can't relate to that, but I just want to give some sort of comfort and peace of mind to those of you like that, that you may not have to be proactively adept at marketing to have good marketing. And there was a lot of gems from everybody like Carla and Stephanie and Adolfo about how that can happen. You may not be like, so this or that on social media, but if you do so much for your product, like you put everything that you believe into this really good product, so good that you give people reasons to share it you make your product look good enough that people will want to share it then they're going to you're going to be able to climb on their backs as is the case with us we are where we are sweet ecstasy because of what everybody else has done for us with social media we are not ingenious we have no techniques but we make our burger, our product, the best way we can and make it look as appetizing as possible in a very normal way, in a common sense way. And when you do that, uh, people want to post. This is why they're buying your food already. Part of eating in this experience of consumerism is the idea that they're going to be able to share this product with other people. And Mm -hmm. that's like, that's a luxury for all of us in this business. So by cultivating that, we just have to do our part. Uh, the, the, the girls around me right now with Carla and Steffi, um, they found a way to really weaponize it and they're so good at it, but you may not necessarily think of that as your strength yet. So in the meantime, just have something that's really genuine and really and good. And delicious. And you're the, and delicious <laughs> and the rest of that all will follow. Yeah. Yeah, and if you awesome. have something good, and then if you study social media marketing, then yeah. <laughs> you're right. Then bam. And it's the best combination of food, right? All you can right, hire I- me. want to hire me. <laughs> there you go, Al. You have your new social media manager. Right I've got Carla as my social media manager. I've got Adolfo for fixing the rest of my business. <laughs> and I, I have Steffi here to teach me what the heck TikTok is because I still don't get it. <laughs> you got your team you got your team right here um yeah. this this um next question which I, I think is really great um and timely because we're talking about you know thriving and striving and thriving throughout a pandemic um they're asking running a business has its highs and lows obviously how do you keep yourself motivated and focused on your goals any tips you can share I think um, for me, the goals have to be written down. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if your goals aren't written down, then you're kind of lost in your daily life because you kind of forget them. Um, So write them down, manifest them, and then do the work. That's it. Same. I always write my goals um, every start of the year. I write my goals down. It's actually on my phone. So I have a life goal, a a finance goal, a health goal, and business goal. So I write them down as if it already happened. This is part of law of attraction. So write them down as if it already happened. And read it every three days and see where you're at. So Can you give an example of that, Carla? Like, what would you write down as if it already happened? One rule, you cannot tell it to anyone. Because it jinxes the goal. It's jinxed. It jinxes the goal. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yourself, keep it in your head. <laughs> and um, yeah. And say it out loud. Like every night, say it out li- loud that you, it's already happening and see what, and see, then thank me later for it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you later. <laughs> Adolfo or Al, um, what about you? Two? I agree with them. Um, there will be down moments other than, of course, if you're happy, there it will take care of itself. But when you're down, you have nothing, no one 
to, um, to make you happy but yourself, right? And I think during the down moments, I agree with Steffi, you need to be very clear with your goal. You need to go back to your why. Why are you doing this? And that will hopefully allow you to wake up one more day and another day. And when you wake up, I think it's important that you are able to do your thanksgiving, count your blessings, you pray. Gratefulness, you yes. I have seen a lot of people who have never prayed so much. They, they pray 10, 20 times more during this pandemic because anytime the Lord can just take us away. Yeah. So I think it's important to pray during the down moments. And Al, what about you? Can you uh can you can you say the question for me again just so I make sure I'm answering you exactly? <laughs> yeah. Um basically there's a lot of highs and lows with running a business. How do you stay motivated and focused on your goals? Do you have tips for people? I don't get I don't even get how I can think of anything else with all that goes on with this business. Yeah. Uh when you start this thing off, you really want yourself to be at the forefront of all of it. I believe this is the key to every great business that succeeded, that you, in the beginning, you personally saw to every single part of the business, even if you're not good at it, from the way everything looks to the way it tastes, from the way you work, who do you, with every, with, for the first six months, we had one cook in the sweet ecstasy kitchen and, and it was me. And mm -hmm. we have, we had one cashier and it was my partner. And uh, when at the end of the day, you know that when, when people can't get to work, when, when there's a, when, when you can't afford to pay salaries anymore, that mm -hmm. you're capable of yes. handling every single aspect of your business, then you have a chance to, 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 handle the lows and then even as things grow and things go in a bunch of different directions you'll still know what every single aspect of your business is about because you have your fingerprints on everything it's amazing yeah i agree with that that's huge yeah that's great that's super inspiring and um, i think it really is a great way to manage expectations for uh new food uh printers. so Thank you guys. Thank you guys. We'll wrap it up right there because I think that's all the time we have for tonight. It's been so fun hanging out with you guys, getting to know all about your stories. So thank you once again, Carla, Steffi, Al, and Adolfo for joining us this evening. I'm sure our audience can agree that it was such an engaging and insightful session. So there you have it, folks. This was series two of Food Business Bootcamp brought to you by La Germania. Um, before we go, don't for forget to follow La Germania on social media. That's La Germania PH on Facebook and Instagram. And to know more about La Germania Philippines' full range of kitchen and home appliances and exclusive offers, visit LaGermaniaPH.com for more details. Once again, my name is Margo Sue, and thank you very much for joining me for this very special boot camp brought to you by La Germania. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.